You, uh... Ray Maker, Ray Walker, Papa Keep. Daddy, Ray, I, Ray in the dark, it's my God, Daddy, who you are. Good morning, and welcome to Central Congregational Church in our online worship service. It has been a blessing to meet each week on Sunday mornings for worship, and then throughout the week as we continue our Bible studies. Uh, this week, we are, we are pleased and excited to get back together throughout the week uh, for our weekly studies. Uh, beginning this evening and each Sunday, our college and career ministry will meet with Chris Anderson at 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday, our adult Bible study, led by Steve Seamus, uh, will continue uh, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Our adult study is titled, Need to Know. Also on Wednesday evening, our youth group will continue to meet at 8 o'clock. Um, our youth group is intended for those grades 7 through 12, and we're excited to get back uh, this week uh, with our, our um, lesson titled, Knowing Jesus as Friend. So Thursday evening, Cheryl Baker will continue to lead our weekly ladies Bible study at 7.30 p.m. The ladies study is working through the book of Colossians. And then on Friday, our men's fellowship study, um, which happens once a month, will meet as well. Um, each Sunday morning, we look forward to the opportunity to get together with you and continue our Sunday school um, classes. Our Sunday school classes are currently running are those for, for youth ministry and our adult studies. Our church website and YouTube channel continue to serve as excellent resources as we continue to connect uh, as a body of believers. Uh, please take a moment and go to centralcongo.org. Um, there on the page, you can sign up for our church emails, as well as uh, review the helps ministry and access our online giving portal. Tithes and offerings can be made uh, online through our website or by mailing a check to the church at 2 Webster Street in Middleborough. All right, a special thank you to Cheryl Kennedy uh, and the donation of masks that you've made to the church. It's definitely been a great blessing uh, to many people um, as we continue to, um, to fight the coronavirus. And then finally, please be sure to subscribe below to the YouTube channel. Uh, by subscribing to the channel, it'll make it an easier access for you each week as you connect for our Sunday service. Uh, also on the YouTube channel, you can check out our weekly testimonies and share those with your friends. As well as uh, this last week, we released a, a very special trivia game uh, for the church. So be sure to check that out. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful day of worship, a day that we give heart and soul and mind and voice to the Lord, to the King of Kings. We're here to lift His name and praise Him. I'd like to read from Psalm 27. It says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. Well, we're here this morning in order to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to inquire of Him in His holy temple. Here we are, the church, we're the body of Christ, and we meet together, maybe in our different homes, but we're meeting together in one heart and one spirit before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's begin in prayer. Father, we thank You so much for this wonderful morning. We thank You for this time that You've given us to lift up Your name and to worship You and to glorify You. We pray, Lord, that You'd move in a powerful way in our midst. May You draw each one closer to Yourself, and may You use this time as one that will, that will impact the kingdom forever. We thank You for it, and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. It's great to speak with you all again. We have a great surprise for you. We have some new VeggieTales stickers. And that's a great surprise too, isn't it? And that reminds me of a surprise many years ago when I was just a teenager at Word of Life camp. I decided to go down and play a little basketball. And when I got there, there were lots of, lots of teenagers and I decided to go and play basketball with them. And we formed two teams. There was an older gentleman there, he was pretty short, and he wanted to play too. And we said, all right, he ended up on my team. And I'm not a very good basketball player, but I figured I'm gonna have to try extra hard today and do my best. But it turned out to my surprise that he was the best basketball player there. In fact, he was one of the best players that I ever saw. He could shoot, he could make baskets, he could dribble, he could pass. He was an incredible player. And later on that night, I had another surprise. It turned out he was not just a basketball player, he was our guest speaker. His name was Don Robbie Robertson. And he shared with us the three basics of the Christian life. And they are know, grow, know and show. show. Say them with me. Know, know grow, grow, and show. show. One more time. Know, know grow, and, and show. show. The first thing is we need to know Jesus as our personal savior. We need to accept him into our hearts. We just need to believe in him. And the second one is to grow in our faith. And we do that by reading our Bibles and praying, and of course, going to church. And finally, we need to show God's love by our kind words and our good deeds. But the first step in the Christian life is just to believe. Jesus died on the cross to give us the free gift of eternal life, and we need to believe in him. Hannah? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Acts 16, 31b. Good job, Hannah. That was wonderful. We just need to believe in Jesus. Let's pray right now. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Please forgive our sins, come into our hearts, and make us members of your family. Dear Lord Jesus, we believe in you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. See you next week. Next we have Ernie Gawet. Ernie is someone who came to know the Lord just a few years ago as part of the ministry of this church, and you're gonna really enjoy his testimony as he shares about all that Christ has done in his life. My name is Ernie Gawet. You know, er early on, I had people pushing me to go to college after high school. But academically, that was not going to happen for me. Um, thank God my girls don't take after me there. So, um, but I could see, you know, where if I look back, where God was prob was working, because the horses gave me the knowledge to do the job that I do today. And um, as far as coming to know the Lord, it it began in 2014 so uh, my upbringing was catholic went to parochial school for eight years never really learned anything about the bible um, was a good home life no drinking no smoking no cussing so home life was good but not a lot of church we did early on <clears throat> But then my father kind of fell out and everybody dropped out. My mom used to watch mass on Sundays. So <clears throat> we brought um, our girls up pretty much. We, we sent them to Mullen Hill for about five or six years. And 2014, my daughter asked me to come to church, which is how this all began. So. I, I said to her, well, I'll, yeah, I'll go. Which one would you like to go to? And we settled on this one because two of my horse customers came here and said it was great. Uh, it was Daniel Smith and Kaylin Foley at the time. So we came, <clears throat> and I asked my daughter all the time because she remembers everything about it. My daughter, after the service, we came out, and my daughter says to me, Dad, what you think? I said, well, it's church. What do you want from me? So she's like, 
well, uh, do you think you'd like to go again? I said, yeah, I'll go again if you want to go. Now, prior to this, Sunday was always, you know, mow the lawn, take care of house things around my yard because I work six days a week otherwise. So this, we, we came back, and somewhere around that time, it was, I, I knew something was happening. I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. But again, I asked my daughter, I said, Val, do you remember after we left church after a couple of weeks? And I said to you, something's happening, and I'm just going to ride it out and see where it goes. And she's like, yeah, I remember that. So I'm going to say, I don't even know the timeline, but two to three, four weeks, I got this urge to play the piano again. And I don't know where it came from. So Danielle was doing the books at the time. So I said to Danielle, I said, can I go play that piano? She said, well, yeah, I'm there on Thursdays around two o'clock. So I came and I played and I was here for like two hours. So then I go back home and I just stewing and stewing about it. And we came back to church <clears throat> and then I got, I had to play the piano again. So I asked her again, came back, played again. And same thing happened. I was just here for two hours and it just flew by. So I went home and I bought some Christian music because I, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was the music I was enjoying or the piano. So I got the music and I was playing the music and that wasn't really doing it at home. So I, I said to my wife, I think I gotta buy a baby grand and she thought I was nuts. So it took me weeks to decide on a baby grand. I, do I get it off the internet? No, I can't do that because this could be wrong, that could be wrong. So I went to a, a piano store called the Piano Mill in Rockland and I got a beautiful baby grand. So then I, I was all excited. I got at home and I put my books up there. I started playing and I was like, oh, this ain't it neither. And that's when it dawned on me that it was the church that was making me whole. So I, I'm not even sure how many, the timeline, but um, there is a picture on the website in 2014 of where I was sitting and I was sitting way in the back. So I know it was either late 2014 or 2015. It was during the worship songs when right before Pastor Duck said, you know, anybody wants to ask Jesus into their heart, say this prayer with me. So I was just doing the prayer. I wasn't looking for anything. And then all of a sudden, they started doing the set of songs. And it was like scales were falling off, like I had this light on me. And I, I felt like I was being stripped, like I was just, it was sort of humiliating, humbling, all this, like within a short span of time. And the tears were coming down <laughs> and they're playing the music. And then it was like, it was just like this comforting warm blanket if you were out in the rain. And I just felt so at peace. So I know, there's no doubt in my mind, I know what happened now. But at the time, I didn't know what was going on. And my daughter knew everything. She looks at me, she says, Dad, are you crying? I'm like, no. But I couldn't stop it. And, and then it's been, I don't know, it just changed after that, everything I saw things differently. Um, people that I probably, you know, if I didn't know them, there was no feel for them. But now it's like people in the church, the fellowship, it's like if they, it's like everything the Bible says, if they mourn, you mourn. You just feel like you can't help it. It's like it's your child or your whatever. Um, so those things have changed. Um, people that I would have discounted, now I know it's just by grace that I'm not going through it. It's nothing I am doing or anything. When, when I play, you know, um, that's one of the things I heard that um, 
during that time I heard I gave you a gift and you threw it away because prior to playing I had not played for 25 years I gave it up to do the horses so now I can't stop playing again and so if someone says to me oh that was so beautiful oh sometimes that's like oh like that heaping coals because it just reminds me of something I threw away and now I just play for him. So, I mean, I feel like I got a long way to go. I mean, I certainly stumble all the time, but um, it, it's better. I have a peace um, that I never had. And even the, the birth, it reminds me of, you know, the, uh, when I read of like Paul's uh, conversion on the road to Damascus and he says the bright light. I think of like if what if, what if you're a baby in a, in the womb, right? You got the water, right? The water breaks. You come through the narrow canal. You got the bright light, and I just feel like I don't know if God's got a sense of humor, but there's so much there. It's so related, the bright lights and the you know the warm blanket. You know you go in the incubator. I I can't explain it except there's so many that are related. You know, I feel like when I hear somebody say that they they didn't have that, I feel like they missed something. Because for me, that is that is like, that was like a big highlight for my life. Outside of, you know, I always say the day I got married and then the, watching my kids be born, that I didn't think there was anything that was gonna happen like that again. But that certainly was right there with it. Mm -hmm. It was just an incredible experience, something I wish I could go through over and over and over again. The title of our message today is Depression to Awe to Unbridled Joy. And it's from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. It's really the final verses of the book. And it's a beautiful book. If you ever have an opportunity just to read it, uh, you will find many verses probably that you'll want to memorize from it. And so I'm going to read this section. Habakkuk says this, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Well, as you notice from the end of that, you can see that this last section that we're looking at was a song that was made to sing and what's fascinating about that is that the song was written during a very very difficult time in Israel's history and as all of us are in this this time in our own lives it's one of great difficulty and and the reason that I chose this passage today is because I'm hoping to encourage you there are probably a lot of us who are in our homes today and we are missing each other we're missing interaction with other people we're missing those times where we can go and just do those things that we're normally used to doing and uh, and uh, we're looking at the future and we're hearing news reports and they're making us fearful and so if there's anyone who could feel the same way it was Habakkuk in fact he was writing ver during a very difficult time in Israel's history which we'll look at in a minute but there are a lot of things. Uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control, has, has put out a report of the kinds of things to watch for during this coronavirus that, that show that maybe we're struggling with depression. Um, some of the things that they, they point out might lead to depression, uh, stress-related items that are happening now, or fear and worry about your health and the health of those you love. Uh, if you're noticing changes in your eating and sleeping patterns, maybe you're, you're having difficulty concentrating. 
Maybe uh, you're dealing with chronic health problems that are getting worse, or uh, maybe you have some kind of mental health condition that you find is, is, is becoming more difficult to manage. And some people are, one of the signs that they're beginning to struggle with depression is that they're turning to substances. Well, this text offers hope for us. Some of us might be looking at this and saying, well, if you're a Christian, you should never struggle with depression. But the reality is, is that Christians do struggle with depression. One of the greatest Christian leaders in the history of the church was a man named Charles Spurgeon. He was British. He lived in the 1800s, and he was the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, uh, the most famous preacher of his day, and he's actually called the Prince of Preachers. But one thing we know about Charles Spurgeon is, is that he struggled deeply and mightily with depression. In fact, um, he called uh, the, the worst form of it that he had to deal with was causeless depression. He once said in a sermon, My spirits were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child, and yet I knew not what I wept for. Some of you might feel like that, like Charles Spurgeon, where you have that sense of maybe even uncaused depression. Well, we can look around us and see a lot of reasons why we might feel it, but others of us might say, well, even though I'm, I'm not in my normal routine, I, I don't know why I feel this way. Well, this prophet that we're looking at in the book, Habakkuk, he was a, he was a man who, who was obviously, as you look at the beginning of this book, struggling with depression. And part of his struggle with depression was his relationship with God. He couldn't understand why God was doing some of the things he was doing and and he was brokenhearted. And so he asks a couple of questions to God in the book, and the Lord graciously responds to him. And it's the Lord's responses to him that, that turned his depression to awe and then his awe to incredible joy. And that's what I pray that you'll experience today. Maybe you're not feeling that way right now, but if you're like most of us, you're going to go through seasons like this. And this text is so helpful for when we find ourselves in times like that. Well, the first question that he was perplexed with is why God allows injustice. Here you have righteous people living in Israel. You had unrighteous people in Israel. And it seemed like the unrighteous people were getting away with what they're doing. Well, God had a simple answer for him and his his answer was that God is going to punish the in injustice. Now, how is God going to punish the injustice? Well, God's means of punishing the injustice was another thing that caused, caused him to be broken. And that was that God was going to use the Babylonians, a nation that was a very powerful nation, who was going to invade Israel and God was going to use them to chasten his people. Well, this raised the second question then that, that Habakkuk was dealing with. How could God use people who are more wicked than, than the people of Israel, the, the people that needed to be disciplined? How could he use more wicked people to discipline people who are less wicked? So God gives three answers to his question. The first answer is that God will preserve the righteous. We read in Habakkuk 2.4 where it says... The righteous shall live by his faith. And so what God was saying was, is that those who trust him will be protected. Those who trust him will not go under God's righteous wrath. The second answer that God gave him was that God will eventually punish the wicked. The Babylonians, in essence, won't escape. We read in Habakkuk 2.16, you have your fill of shame, and he's speaking, of, speaking to the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, you will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. And so what the Lord is promising is, yes, he's going to use Babylon to chasten Israel, but eventually God is going to then deal with Babylon. So they're not going to get away with it. The, un, uh, the wicked are not going to get away with their dealings. And the third answer that God gives is that eventually he will deal with the dysfunction of human sin and it will be completely gone. We notice this in Habakkuk 
2.14. It says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so what he's saying is, is that there's going to come a time in the future when God will eradicate all evil. First of all, he is going to preserve the righteous. Second of all, he is going to punish the wicked. And third, he is going to straighten everything out and he's going to make it the way that it should be. And so after he was thinking about the answers that the Lord gave him, it, it changed everything. His depression turned to awe as he thought about what he had heard from God. And so one of the things that you hopefully you noticed or you took from Ernie's testimony this morning was the fact that that uh, Ernie's life was changed from top to bottom. It was changed from the upside down, the inside out. He pointed out that he cannot imagine anyone entering a relationship with Jesus Christ and not becoming a completely different person. Well, this is exactly what happened in the life of this prophet. Now, this prophet knew the Lord before this, but he experienced the Lord in a whole new way that he had never known before, and it completely changed everything. He goes from being this depressed prophet to being one who is overwhelmed with the power and the glory of God. We notice in verse 16, he says this of chapter 3, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. What is he speaking about? He's speaking about the awesome power of God. Throughout the whole third chapter, he was meditating on who God was. He received these messages from the Lord in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and then he, he began to consider who God was, and then he realized that God is the great defender of His people. And just read through chapter 3, and you will see that, where God puts His awesome power on display, and, and Habakkuk is shaken to the very core of his soul. Think about that. His body trembles. He is in such awe of God that his whole body is trembling. His lips are quivering at the sound. Uh, his, his bones feel like they're disintegrating. This is the idea, decaying, rottenness, uh, of, of the, that, the, the rottenness that's entering his bones. His legs tremble beneath him. Uh, a number of times when I've read through the book of Habakkuk and I've gotten to that part and I've heard or I've read what he said about this, this utter fear that overtook him. So often I would read the book and I would think that the utter fear that overtook him was an anticipation of the looming invasion of the Babylonians. But that isn't the case. He's not afraid of the Babylonians. He is so shaken up by the power of God that his whole body trembles. It, it causes a a reaction, a palpable reaction in his, in his own body. It convulses just as he realizes the immeasurable power of the glorious God. And so, in reaction to this, as he contemplates how great of a God God is and how he vindicates his people and how he preserves the righteous and how one day he will bring his judgment upon the Babylonians, he writes in the second part of verse 16, Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. I don't know if you've ever had an experience where you sense that you were in the presence of God in a way unlike you'd ever experienced before. I remember a few decades ago, I was sitting and reading my Bible and as I was reading my Bible, all kinds of things started to flash through my head, all kinds of sin in my life, unconfessed sin in my life. And I could not escape it. I had the sense that I was in the presence of God and that I needed to deal with it. And the reason why I had not dealt with that sin was because I was more afraid of, of being open and honest about my sin than I was of God. Well, at that moment when I was in that situation and I was reading my Bible and I, there was a, just such a real sense of the manifest presence of God in that room, I became more afraid of God 
than keeping my sin secret. I had to leave right from that spot. I had to go and I had to confess. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that. Probably you have. This is exactly the kind of experience that Habakkuk had. His was not about his own sin. His was about just the mighty power of God and his ability to preserve his people and he will mete out justice and one day he is going to straighten everything out. He understood that. And he was so filled with awe that it changed everything about the way that he looked, about, looked at his circumstances. His circumstantial troubles melted away as he contemplated the glory and the power and the infinite majesty of God. In fact, I find it interesting that at this point he's no longer blaming God. You know, at the beginning of the book and the questions he asks, he can't understand why God is doing this and that. And now that he sees God, he knows that there's no point in doing that because everything that God does, he does the right way. He is so enamored with God that he treats him with utmost respect. That's the mark of somebody who's been in the presence of God. It's a reminder of of Isaiah when he, when, when he was in the manifest presence of God in Isaiah 6, 5, when he cried out, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I will tell you right now, just like we heard in Ernie's testimony, if you have ever experienced what it is to be in the manifest presence of God, everything changes. Your perspective changes, your life changes, your priorities change. And we see this happen in Habakkuk's life. He's no longer the one who's, who's uh, pointing his finger at God, but now he begins to realize, he begins to tremble in his presence. He begins to realize what a mighty and great God he is. I just want to speak to the person that might be hearing this and and we realize that, that on the one hand, uh, we, can, we can look at this and we can kind of be upset with this story because Israel is going to be victimized by the Babylonians. And maybe you see the story and maybe like them and you say, I've been victimized in my life and I'm, I'm upset that that's happened. There might be some who feel that way. I want you to know that God is going to set everything straight that is crooked. There's nothing that he's not gonna that he's not gonna repair. There, he's gonna meet out justice perfectly. There might be others who are watching this, and you think about your life, and you might realize that you have been the one who has made the victims. You might be the victimizer. You might think back to something in your past, or maybe something in your present, and you say to yourself, "Well, if God is going to bring all of these things in judgment, I'm in trouble." I want you to know that there's only one way out of it for you. There's only one way out of it. But that one way is sure. It's a way that was made by Jesus. You see, Jesus went to the cross. And the reason that he went to the cross was to pay for the sins of the world. He went to the cross to be a substitute for his people. If you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you turn from your sin and trust Him as your Savior, I want you to know that your sins will be forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, so far will He remove your sins from you. He'll take your sin and cast it into the depth of the, depths of the sea. And you say, well, well, what happened to my sin? Uh, isn't God a just God? Well, yes, God's a just God. You see, what He did was He punished Jesus for your sin and my sin. And it's through Jesus that you can have life. And that's why a relationship with Jesus is so revolutionary and why it changes our lives. Because it is our only way out. It is our only escape. It is our only hope. But the glorious thing is, is that it's a sure hope. There's no doubt about it. But you must turn to Him and repent and He'll give you that new life He promises in fact, we notice here uh, how he says in verses 17 through 19, we notice that his awe turns to joy when he realizes that God really cared for him. So we have the story of a man who starts, he's depressed, and then he's filled with awe for God, and then his awe is turned to joy. 
Notice this picture. There are these six uh, conditional clauses. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor a fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olives fails, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. What is he doing? Well, it's interesting. Each of these six are more grave than the previous one. For instance, he says, and this is very poetic, though the fig tree should not blossom. You see, when the Babylonians come, they are going to destroy their fig trees. Now, for people in Israel, this would be a, a, a big inconvenience, but figs were more of a delicacy. They could, they could live without figs. And he says, uh, the, nor be fruit on the vines. Um, again, uh, the, the people would drink wine made from grapes. And so, but, but they didn't necessarily have to have that. It would be an inconvenience not to have that. They could drink water, the water that wasn't that great, but they could drink it. But it gets a little more intense as you go. The produce of the olive fail. The olive was something that was used for cooking and lighting fires. Okay, now this is a bigger problem if they lose their olive crop. And then he says, and the fields yield no food. Now, now the grain that was grown in the field was the staple of their diet. If they lost that, now you're talking about starvation mode. The flock be cut off from the fold. Well, the flocks, sheep, goats, that, that was a sign of their wealth. Sheep and goats, they provided wool for clothing and occasional food. And then it says, there be no herd in the stalls. This was also another sign of their wealth. The, the, they didn't eat the cattle typically, but what they would do is that they would use the cattle to plow their fields and they would use the cattle to do work that people couldn't do. And what he is thinking about is an absolute devastation. In fact, Kenneth Barker, an Old Testament scholar, he says this, the loss of any of these individually might be survived. Together, the losses spelled economic disaster and devastating loss of hope, loss of their daily provisions, loss of their economic strength, loss of the Lord's blessing due to their sin. You are talking about something that was absolutely devastating, something far beyond anything we could ever imagine during this coronavirus pandemic. Now, I know a lot of us are probably really struggling. We think about our jobs and our businesses, and that is a fearful thing. And you have to understand that Habakkuk was looking into the same kind of situation. But let's see how he handled it as he saw it coming. He says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Okay, uh, there's a couple of things we can take from this passage. A couple of applications I'd like to make. Number one, remember that God uses our depression for a good purpose. He makes us more like Jesus. God used Habakkuk's depression to do something extraordinary in his life. He got his attention. He turned his attention into awe. And now he turns it into joy. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. These, these things that he lists are no joke. They're no hypotheticals. They're realities. And they came to pass and the life of Israel. Yet he is undaunted in the midst of it. Why? Because he has seen God. He has seen God. It's important. It's important just like him. When you're facing uncertainty in life, when I'm facing uncertainty in life, and we're thinking about how we're going to handle it, it's interesting that he, he does this. He declares, he says, this is how I'm going to handle the situation in advance. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation because he recognizes that even though these circumstances are terrible, he understands that God has a greater purpose in all of it and God is going to do something amazing and that ultimately God is going to rescue him from all of it. Reminds me of the story of Michael Phelps in the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. He was swimming in the 200 meter butterfly. It's his, one of his best events and he was going to break the all-time record for most gold medals for any, any athlete. And so... Uh, as, the, as the race started, uh, he took off, he was in the lead, and finally he, he uh, flipped around in the final term for the home stretch where he usually pours it on, and all of a sudden something that had never happened happened in this race. 
his goggles filled with water. He could not see his lane. He couldn't see anything. He didn't know how far he was from the home stretch. But if you go back and you watch the video of that race, it looks like he is totally un unhindered in, in his race. And so the question was, how did he do it? And, and by the way, when he finished the race, he had no idea how well he did. And he finally looked up. He was shocked to see that he set a, set a world record after winning the race. Well, how did he do it? He said that he had visualized that race so many times in his mind that he knew exactly what he was going to do so that even though he couldn't see in front of him, it didn't matter. He already had a plan for it. He, had already, he already knew the number of strokes it would take him to complete that side of the pool to finish the race. He had it all memorized. He had it all thought out so that when something terrible happened, he was ready to respond. Sometimes when trouble comes into our lives, we're not ready to respond because we haven't thought about it in advance. But this is something Habakkuk does. He says, even though, even if we go under, we, we face total destruction, which they did, he said, again, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Once he had experienced God in all of his fullness and all of his wonder, nothing could distract him from that, knowing that this God saved him. He marked it out in advance. The second lesson that we can take from this is that when facing uncertainty, we must not focus on our lack, but God's ability to provide in His time. When facing uncertainty, we must not focus on our lack, but God's ability to provide in His time. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I don't like heights. People who are good with heights often will say, uh, oh, just don't look down and you'll be fine. Well, that's easier said than done. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever climbed up the side of a house and then all of a sudden you get to a spot and you're just kind of frozen there on the side of the house. I won't tell you whether that's happened to me or not, but you can probably guess. Well, um, we notice here that um, this man keeps his eyes fixed on the Lord. Look at what he says in verse 19. He says, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. This is his, his sense of the Lord. Even, even though he might find himself in difficulty and in struggles and in trials, he rejoices in the God of salvation because he can even go to dangerous heights and, and he can walk on those dangerous heights like a, like a deer, with the grace of a deer, with no fear or worry or falling. You see... He can't help but be merry because he's, he's focused on the greatness and the wonder of the Lord. We, we, have, a, we have a person that used to be part of our, our congregation and um, one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had, and I've shared this before with you, but one of the most amazing experiences I had was at his bedside and he was very, very sick and the doctor was sharing with him about his his situation and that it looked bleak and that they were going to induce him into a coma and they were hoping to save his life. And the room was very quiet. His family, loving family, was gathered around him. It was Rob Webb, Jane's husband. And, and the doctor stepped out of the room and, and uh, Rob looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, you know me, I'm a fighter, and I'm going to give it everything I've got. He said, but if I don't make it, he's thinking about heaven. He goes, it's going to be a party. <laughs> Do you have that kind of peace? That's the peace of somebody who knew the Lord. That's a piece of somebody who knows the Lord. He was so sure. His eyes were so fixed on the prize that no doubt entered his mind. His hope was so set on Jesus that he knew where he was going. My question to you is, do you know this? Do you know him? Have you experienced this? Has he changed you? Have you turned to him? 
in your brokenness, have you looked to Him? He will turn, He will turn your brokenness, your depression, He will turn it to awe, and He'll turn your awe to joy. Because you know the King of kings and Lord of lords, your salvation, your God of salvation. Let's pray. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here who's listening to this, Father, who has never entered into a personal relationship with you, who does not know this peace that Habakkuk had, this peace that Rob had, this peace that Ernie has, Lord, we pray that they would Right now, call out to you and say, Oh, God, save me. I need you. Take my life. Use it for your glory. That I might be yours, always for your, yours, always yours, ever for you. And Father, for the Christian Lord who perhaps has, has had their eyes maybe focused in other places, maybe on their circumstances, Lord, help them to lift their eyes to you and see that, that you are the one who gives help in due season and in due time. Lord, we pray that you'd comfort them and strengthen them. Help them to see, Lord, that you are faithful and that you love your people and that you sustain them and carry them. Oh, Lord, may you show them this. We ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Oh,